Practical Farmers of Iowa started back in 1985. And PFI is a nonprofit organization made up of farmers and friends of farmers. And our farmers come from uh, farms all over the state of Iowa and far beyond and from farms of all shapes and sizes, big and small and everything in between. And our mission at PFI is to strengthen farms and communities through farmer-led investigation and information sharing. And we use this um, mission to, uh, to help our farmers practice an agriculture that benefits both the land and the community. Our values at PFI are welcoming everyone, creativity, collaboration, and community, viable farms now and for future generations, and stewardship and ecology. So if you like the kinds of things that we do at PFI, you should join us. We are a member-based organization, and your membership supports our work and allows you to tap into our network of members, which is um, growing to about 3,000 strong right now. So as a member, you'll get newsletters, discounts to our events, the opportunity to participate in our research projects and all of our programming. Um, our, our members really do guide the programming that we provide, and these farm and our topics are a great example of that. You can get all the uh, membership information on our website. And also on our website is this uh, calendar of events. These, this calendar lists both PFI and non-PFI events. And this time of year, you'll find a lot of workshops and conferences across the state and across the Midwest. So definitely check out our event calendar for anything that uh, might pique your interest. And as far as events goes, the biggest one that we do is coming up in January 22nd and 23rd in Ames, Iowa. That's our uh, annual conference. And um, we've got about 40 sessions planned, uh, just loaded with really good content. A lot of small grain stuff. We have a small grain short course happening before the conference. We have a lot of cover crop sessions, a lot of grazing related sessions. And just before our conference in the same location actually is the Iowa Forage and Grassland Council Conference, which is January 21 and 22nd. So you can come to Ames for the 20, 21, 22, and 23rd in Ames for um, a whole lot of really great education. You can get more information about this conference um, on our website there once again. So as far as uh, Farm and Our Rules go for tonight, um, thank you everybody for entering your uh, email and location into the chat box. Like I said, we do collect that for grant reporting and for evaluating these. Um, so appreciate that. Uh, as we go tonight, our presenters are going to give their presentations, and if you have questions along the way, feel free to enter them right into that same chat box. And um, if the presenters see it and want to uh, answer your question at that moment, they can, but we are going to reserve the final 30 minutes to go through those questions. So um, if you have a question, type it in there. Otherwise, you can ha hang on to it, and we'll, um, we'll get to it after the presentations are done. So I, I am recording this farminar, and um, so if you want to share it with your friends or, or watch it again in a few days, it'll be on our website um, in our Farm and Our archives. And so now I'm going to pull up uh, Dr. Andy Lenson's presentation and let him take it away here. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, Nathan Anderson and me and Steve Carlson. Uh, it's a pleasure to chat with you tonight about cover crops in Iowa, alternatives to winter rye. Hopefully I won't have too many issues using the buttons doing this tonight. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we use cover crops. A few of them are listed on this slide. These are universal, no matter what your location is. Uh, cover crops can really help reduce soil erosion. They can reduce nitrogen losses. They can oftentimes increase soil carbon, generally improve soil health, and sometimes improve weed management. Uh, in Iowa, we have about five, in our conventional corn, soybean, or continuous corn systems, we have five to seven months per year where we don't have living plants on the soil. And there, there are large ramifications of that. And in our, in our systems, our, our crops typically use that time of the year when we accrue heat units, times when plants will actually grow. So we have small windows to grow cover crops outside of corn and soybeans. 
uh, in, in past research and farmer experiences, Winterai has proven to be one of the better options, perhaps the best option so far. In most of the research and actual field plantings of cover crops have been done with winter rye. However, winter rye is not perfect and there are some issues with it. Um, quite a few of you may have heard previously about problems for corn that follows a winter rye cover crop. This is a slide provided by Tom Casper with USDA Agricultural Research Service in Ames, Iowa. And it shows a corn seedling that's been dug out of the ground. And right here, you can see the blue arrow. Um, and that's pointing at the radical. And that's sort of the first root that comes out of a seedling. And this one you can see is a little bit, has some black areas. That's a diseased radical. So there, there can be some negative issues with that. The common recommendation, if you're going to plant corn following a, a winter rye cover crop, is to terminate that cover crop at least 10 days before you plant corn. It's part of an ongoing experiment that uh, Tom Casper and Allison Robinson with ISU at, and Plant Path, Jackson Archaya with Plant Path, and uh, Matt Bacher with ARS and me in agronomy, we've been looking at this for a couple of years and trying to determine what it is. A lot of people have said that it's an allelopathic issue, that, that rye will occasionally decrease yield of subsequent corn. Some people say it's nitrogen. Some people say it's lack of water. And in this studies, we've been looking at the influence of different plant pathogens. And here we have some results from 2014. In the top line, you can see a no rye control. And actually, almost 60% of the radicals, or 60% of the corn plants, have an infected radical early in the growing season. And that's with no rye. Where we had rye, second line down, DBP. I will try and turn that up. Turn up my yeah, hey, Andy. Message. Sorry about that. There is a better. It's um, if you hit that down arrow next to your microphone icon at the top, then there's the adjust microphone volume right there, and you can try that. Okay. Um, okay. So back to back to this slide. Hopefully, people can hear me better now. Um, DBP is days before planting. So here we have rye terminated 21, 14, 10, and three days before planting, and then rye terminated one day after corn is planted. So that's days after planting. And looking at uh, center column. Uh, percent radical infection you can see it increases as we get the close as we get closer and closer to when rye is terminated you're welcome Steve and uh, what does this have for an effect on yield well it can be fairly dramatic and on this table and others when I have letters that follow means it means they they were different at five percent probability okay and that'll be consistent throughout all the slides so where we have an a whether it's an A or a B, just an A. An A signifies that these means, 221, 209, 215, and 217 bushels per acre are not different statistically. But that 221, no rye control yield, is statistically greater than the 204, where rye was terminated three days before planting, or the 197 bushels per acre, where rye was terminated one day after planting. Study was repeated in 2015, and the results are somewhat, are fairly similar. The radical infection with no winter rye this time is quite a bit lower, and it's not different from where rye was terminated 21 and 14 days before planting. But the radical infection of corn is much great, is is much higher where rye was terminated 10 th or three days before planting or one day after planting, and as in the previous year. 
we have greater yields the longer the period between rye termination and corn planting. Now this sort of phenomena it does happen. It's happened in farmer fields, uh, maybe about 5% of the time. It's a fairly rare occurrence, but it does happen. And it's something that we're interested in solving. So it looks like it it is a pathogen problem. It's probably a, some combination of, of Pythium and Fusarium. And again, that's work by our plant pathologists, uh, Allison, Allison Robinson, Jatsna Archaya, and uh, Tom Moorman with ARS. So we're interested in other options uh, so that perhaps we can have other kinds of cover crops follow soybean or proceed 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 corn anyway. And so we've, there's a lot of popular press and, and a lot of advertising for oat and oilseed radishes cover crops. Annual ryegrass has also been heavily advertised. Uh, third line on this slide has a range of cover crop species. I could fill up the slide with a lot of other, other commonly used cover crops in other locations, but most of these have fairly limited research results available in the upper Midwest. We've also had a lot of popular press the last few years on, on the value of using mixtures, uh, particularly eight-way mixtures uh, from NRCS and other sources, but there are really very limited research results available showing whether these are actually effective or not. One thing that's very important in Iowa, because we have that short season to grow them between uh, in our non-crop periods, because we do have winter in Iowa. We have to have cover crops that will germinate and emerge in the fall and survive the winter. That's really important. A lot of our nitrate loss issues in Iowa soils occur in the subsequent spring. So we need cover crops that are ready to go and use that up, take, take water up and use that nitrate so we don't lose it prior to having crops back on the soil. Well, this is a map of the USDA plant hardiness zones, not exactly cover crops, but I use this as an illustration uh, to highlight why research in the upper Midwest is important and why when you're, when you're talking with people about cover crops, and looking into buying new ones or different mixes, it's important to know where the information is coming from that's being provided to you on how well these different cover crops will work. Uh, California, California, University of California Davis research has been working with cover crops for 40, over 40 years now, done a lot of great research. However, the environment in nearly all of California is not very similar to Iowa. Uh, you go down to Georgia, light green color in the southeastern U.S. A lot of great cover crop work has been done there, particularly on binary mixtures by Upendra St. Jew and his co-workers. Rye and Harry Vetch is a wonderful cover crop down there over the winter, preceding corn, cotton, and sorghum. Their weather is quite a bit different than ours. They have a lot of heat units throughout the winter. Another location with a long history of cover crop research is Beltsville, Maryland. Uh, the home, the home of USDA Agricultural Research Service. They've been working on cover crops there for a number of decades. Their research is great, but the environment is totally different from the upper Midwest. Things, cover crops that will work really well, preceding corn that grow over the winter in Maryland or Georgia or California might not work so well in Iowa. We have winter. So as, as part of a USDA funded project with uh, me and Tom Casper and Mary Wiedenhoft in, uh, also in the Department of Agronomy, we're looking at individual, diff individual cover crops, nine of them, five two-way mixtures of cover crops and two three-way mixtures. Uh, at the top line you'll see on, on your left of your screen, you'll see winter rye or cultivar of winter rye is Spooner. Our cultivar of winter triticale is Trical 102. The next line you see spring oat, that's 
followed by VNS, that's variety not stated. We did not have access to uh, certified seed in this case. It's a variety not stated. We don't know what variety it is. You can read the, the list of cultivars here. Uh, we have cultivar, known cultivars for all of our cover crops, except the spring oat and the hairy vetch. And then we also again have the five two-way mixes and the three two three-way mixes. It's important to mention, I think here, that our four grasses, when a rye, triticale, spring oat, and spring barley, are all in one plant family. Our two canolas, turnip and camelina, are in a different plant family. They're in brassicaceae, commonly called brassicas. And then hairy vetch is a legume, and it's in a separate family. So we have three different plants from three different families here. And our three-way mixes are based on having entries from the different families. And for those of you who are not familiar with turnip and canola, uh, in this slide on your left, we have a Brassica napus canola. And on the right, we have a Brassica rapa turnip. These are taken, this was taken in the fall. Here's a close-up of Camelina sativa. Again, it's another brassica. This was uh, no-till seeded, dribbled actually onto corn stubble following harvest. This is fall growth. Just show you what it looks like. Here's a little bit further back picture with winter rye in the center. Uh, to the left of there, you see a strip with no cover crop. And then uh, sort of on the right of the slide, we have again, uh, the Camelina sativa, in this case, uh, bison. Okay, so I'm going to present now some of the results from that USDA-funded study. I want to give credit to Seth Applegate. He's the, the MS student who's working on this. He's done just a fabulous job. And uh, I wish he could be here tonight, but I think he's prepping for an exam. So he was unable to join us. This study, in all cases, the cover crops were drilled, no tilled one to two days following combine harvest of full season soybeans. We are not planting 0.8 maturity soybeans, We're planting two fives, two sixes, two sevens. So soybean growth is, it's long season, standard cultivars. 2013, fall of 2013, cover crops are seeded at Ames and Lewis. Lewis is about 15 miles south of Atlantic, Iowa, down the southwest part of the state. And again, our planting dates were mid to late October 2014, following soybean harvest. Uh, we drilled three sites this time, Boone, which is near Ames, Lewis, south of Atlantic, and then Sutherland up near Cherokee, North Cherokee, where Nathan is from. We'll be talking later. Um, these are some of the areas of cover crops and the subsequent corn that we were interested in. Seth has done much of the data collection. Now in this and subsequent uh, figures are, are somewhat similar. The, in, we're gonna have the individual bars on the left at the Y axis. We have in this case biomass and it's in pounds per acre. That is pounds per acre. It's from three sites for fall biomass, although we planted five sites. Again, we have our letters on top of the bars. Within each bar, say the one on the left for rye, 49, that means rye actually had 49 pounds per acre. You can kind of guesstimate that by looking at that 50 on the y-axis. The highest yielding cover crop from our three sites where we had fall biomass was the rye camelina two-way mixture. It's 61 pounds per acre, and that seems pretty slight. And we only have this from three, slight, from three sites. Uh, no, we didn't miss the date at two sites. Uh, the Ames planting in October 31st of 2013, 2014, excuse me, never came out of the ground in the fall, never emerged. We also had one of our two sites in 2013 where the winter rye emerged about a quarter to half an inch. That was it before winter hit. We don't have a lot of heat units in Iowa following combine harvest of our crops. One thing that stands out here is that rye at 49 by itself on the far left. There's the arrow, almost got it, nope. Oh well, 
anyway, on the far left is rye by itself at 49. It has an AB on top. Okay, you'll notice here rye with canola, rye with camelina, rye with vetch, or the three-way mixture with rye all have an A. So statistically, they're not different. Triticale at 38 is also not different from by itself from the two-way or the three-way mixtures either. This fall, we have very little biomass accumulation in the fall. In subsequent spring, at termination, and termination at our five sites occurred in late April to early May. It was not all done on the same day, which is really good for Seth since he couldn't be in five places at once. And this graph is, a, this figure is a little bit different. The grass component in this case is brown. So rye, the whole bar is brown. The brassicas, they're blue. So camelina is blue. Turnip by itself is blue. When they're in a mix, as this one, rye and camelina, the rye is the brown, and that's at 566 pounds an acre. And the camelina is at 84. When we have hairy vetch in a mixture, whether it's two or a three-way, well, that's interesting. The uh, values have disappeared on this slide. Hmm, they were there earlier today. Sorry about that. Anyway, you can see the very small bars. As I recall, the vetch accumulated about 67 pounds of biomass per acre. 67 pounds, next to nothing. I forgot to mention on the previous slide where vetch was at four pounds. We seeded the vetch at 10 pounds of seed per acre. This is above ground biomass only. We did not dig roots on this. Good question. And the biomass is oven dried, not air dried. We use an oven. And so you can see the values for our vetch is small in all cases of, in the mixtures, smaller than vetch by itself because vetch is just not very competitive. So we hear a lot about including vetch in, in mixtures and Vetch seed can be fairly pricey. These results would indicate maybe including vetch is not a great idea. Again, mention that rye by itself is not different in terms of yield at termination from two-way or the three-way mix. Triticale by itself is not statistically different from the two or the three-way mixtures for biomass accumulation. Look at the amount of carbon. Carbon is real important for soil health, organic carbon particularly. And the results here are quite similar to what we saw in the previous slide. Rye by itself is not different from rye with canola, camelina, hairy vetch, or the three-way mixture. Triticale by itself is not different from any of the three mixtures with triticale, whether it's two-way or a three-way. This one, this one is, is important. How much nitrogen we've accumulated in these cover crops. Um, like once again, and this is a termination. So in this case, I don't have the crops, the cover crops that died in the, in the fall. And I guess I didn't point that out well enough. Our canola, both of our canola cultivars emerged, but they died in the fall and did not did not regrow again in the spring. Barley and oat, spring barley and spring oat, are, are often uh, suggested for use as cover crops because you don't have to kill them in the spring. They will winter kill. Well, they, don't, they might accumulate some nitrogen in the fall, but that nitrogen is then lost as the, material is, as the plant material is degraded in the spring. And that nitrogen is likely lost to leaching or denitrification. You haven't solved the environmental problem of losing nitrogen. My assumption here is that um, all of the, all or nearly all of the nitrogen that's accumulated in these cover crops would otherwise have been lost. So our rye, rye mixtures accumulating not quite 20 pounds of N. Triticale and camelina quite similar at about a little over 11 pounds. And the triticale by itself is not statistically different from triticale mixtures. Note that vetch accumulates very little N. 
vet, hairy vetch is not fixing nitrogen under the conditions where we're growing it as a cover crop in corn soybean systems. We just don't have enough heat units and fixation requires warm soils. We don't have warm soils late fall and early spring in Iowa, not even in 2012. We look at our weeds, weed compos we're not looking at weed community here, just the number of weeds per square foot. And in this case, we've got the control where it's no cover crop versus cover crop, sole cover crops by themselves. And these are the plots where the cover crops died or at termination. Termination was with glyphosate before we planted. Uh, and in the mixtures, and here we don't have any significant differences among our treatments. No statistical differences. Kind of jumping ahead here to corn now at V2, V3 stage when Seth took weed counts again. And once more, we don't have any differences among our cover crop treatments and the control for weed density. Okay, so in this study, we're not seeing any influence of cover crops on weeds in the subsequent crop. Stay at this date, V2, V3, we did not have differences in uh, density of our corn population. So we're not planting at 34,000 seed per acre. Let's see, I got, have a message here. Are all these cover crops no-till drilled in? The answer is yes, they are drilled. And no, we are not using any starter fertilizer when we plant the cover crops. That's a good question. Keep these questions coming. We look at spring soil nitrate concentration at cover crop termination. We do have differences. And here we're looking at five sites again. And in this case, you see the control here all the way on your left. Uh, nitrate concentration, and I believe that is the top foot of soil, a uh, little about 10 and a half parts per million. Okay, so we're a little over 41 pounds. Um, we haven't fertilized for corn yet. We terminate, fertilize, and then plant. In this case, note that the control is not different from the camelina, the turnip, the vetch, and then our four entries that died in the fall, the two canolas, the barley, and the oat. However, rye, where we had winter rye, significantly lower nitrate concentration. Same thing with, and it's not different from any of the two-way or the three-way mixture with rye. Triticale. B, C, D, E, it's also statistically similar to all three of the mixtures where triticale was included as a grass component. So with rye, we are seeing a decrease in the soil nitrate concentration before we fertilize for corn. Uh, I've got a question here. Uh, are we concerned about the lack of growth that might be due to a lack of available N? Uh, no, I'm not. We're following soybeans. And uh, the residue degrades pretty quickly. And although I'm not presenting tonight the uh, nitrate concentration from the soybeans from, in the soil at planting, it was adequate. P and K are adequate. Uh, uh, nutrition is not a problem in this case, I don't believe. It's a lack of heat units, not a lack of soil fertility. Look at water at, at uh, corn planting. Uh, one of the knocks some years on cover crops is that they use a lot of soil water. Here we're looking at soil water at the eight inch depth. I know, I, I assume nobody is ever planting corn at eight inches. That would not go well hard on your planter and you won't get a stand. Anyway, it, it looks like there are large differences among our treatments here. There are statistical differences. However, if you look at them, we're looking at 47% volumetric water to 51% volumetric water. That's wet. It's, we're using a little bit of water. It's, it's slightly lower where we have rye and mixtures with rye, but it's not what I would call dry out, dried out at all. 
coming from Montana, we could go years without ever, uh, without ever seeing volumetric water content on dry land at 40%. This is good mo soil moisture at eight inches. Same date, three inch depth. Notice that it's much drier. We're down a little to approximately 30 to 34, 35% volumetric water content. And that's good because we can plant on that. 46%, 50% volumetric water content, you can't plant corn, not with a tractor. So here we don't have significant differences among our treatments. Of course, several of these sites are 2015 and none of most of us didn't have drought conditions at planting in 2015. So that was at corn planting. At V6, the yellow bars here, in this graph are volumetric water at eight inches, red bars, volumetric water at three inches. Um, pretty similar to what we saw in the previous graph at, at, uh, at planting. No differences in volumetric water content among our treatments, only differences by depth. R1 stage of corn, that's tasseling. Again, no differences among our treatments. You'll note for the, this graph and the previous one, we're down to four sites. That's because we lost uh, one of our sites in our site in Ames in 2014. Had to abandon that one. The third time, the third time, two thirds of our plots went underwater after a heavy rainfall. I don't know if people are familiar with spad meters. It's uh, an instrument that measures greenness. So it's it's measuring. It's related to chlorophyll more than nitrogen but that chlorophyll is related to nitrogen. So the greener your corn, the better. If you have yellow corn, generally you know it's nitrogen deficient or, it's, or another deficiency, could be iron. Generally it's nitrogen. So Seth also measured, took SPAD readings at a couple of, couple of periods. This one's at uh, V6. Note that uh, the control with an AB is not different from corn following turnip or vetch, either canola, barley, and oat. But our corn following rye, and the mixtures with rye, are a little bit less green. Now, they're not really low, because you know the scale here only extends from 43 to 51. We're not zero to 51. But the instrument could detect that the, that the corn was just a little bit less green. Our fertilization rate, I believe was 150 pounds of N at all sites. And the, uh, the sited aims that we lost, we actually top dressed, but that was after the uh, second flood and we gave up after that third flood. SPAD meetings at tasseling. Again, the control is not different from all of the entries that died in the fall and the turnip. It's not different from the camelina. It's actually not different from the rye, but it is a little bit less green where we have rye in, in the two-way, in, in one of the three-way mixes. A little bit less green. How does this translate to yield? Well, statistically, we don't have, across our four site years, we don't have any significant differences for the cover crops across corn. So you might talk about trends, I prefer not to when we don't have significant differences. Our yields were not inferior. Again, this is four different site years, one from 2014, three from 2015. Yields are, yields are respectable. They're not bin busters, but they were okay. So we're not seeing large differences in this study in how the cover crops influence corn. How about cover crops following soybean? I have five minutes left, I think, Steve. Yes, I do. 736. Yep, yep, yep. So this is a study that, okay. This is a study that was done near Ames for two years. And in, in this case, it's a corn silage cover crop soybean study. So following cover crops after corn silage gives us at least three weeks additional heat units following chopping corn versus combining corn. Our cover crops this time, no mixtures, just spooner rye, citro canola, bison, camelina, and purple top turnip. We had all four of these entries in the previous study. 
Cover crops were terminated at two dates, early and late May. And these were by design to bracket the former RMA, Risk Management Agency guidelines for whether you could insure your crop or not. Uh, and then at each harvest date, we had plots where we removed the cover crop biomass, mimicking a forage harvest, or where we did, or we just chopped it and left it in place. And this study was conducted by Tim Sklenar, another master student. Again, this shows a canola plot in the fall and winter rye. And this these graphs, the next few are in SI units, but to try and make this a little easier for you, this is at 0% moisture on the forage. It's labeled this time. So 8,000 kilograms per hectare at zero, for it, at zero moisture, that's four tons per acre or 8,000 pounds per acre. 4,000 kilograms per hectare, zero moisture, that's two tons, two tons per acre or 4,000 pounds. So in this study, you look at the, at the Camelina in 2013, 2014, of our four cover crops, Camelina in 2013 accrued fairly nominal amount of biomass. We had very poor stand that year. Stands were excellent in 2014. We were learning. I was learning. Give me credit for that. Not doing as well the first year. And we still got a little over pretty close to three quarters of a ton of dry matter before we terminated the camelina. And that's in at the late May termination date. Uh, canola, a large, larger accumulation than we have in early and mid-May the next spring. It's because camelina, uh, canola can grow pretty well in the fall, then it'll die back to the ground and it resumes growth in Iowa, from what I've seen, by axillary buds starting up again or crown buds so all those leaves die the nitrogen they accumulated goes back to the soil and then you start over but in 2013 canola had over a thousand pounds an acre 2014 well it died back in the winter and it was dead did not handle 21 below without snow cover apparently our turnip similar to the canola pretty good growth in the fall but in both years, 2013 and 2014, no regrowth, died and was, and, and, and was dead. When a rye, highest accumulation of growth following corn silage in both years, and you can see over four ton an acre in 2013 by late May, and over three ton an acre late May in 2014. Pretty good growth. Nitrogen accumulation in these cover crops. Under 20 pounds for the camelina, pretty similar to what we had in the previous study in 2013. 2014 did much better. Of course, this went to late May instead of termination in early May. Here we're over 40 pounds. Much better than the canola this year in 2014, which again died. Same with the turnip. Canola in 2013, however, overwintered, and you can see it uh, accumulated, eh, pushing 30 pounds. Not, not great, but there's something there if you're interested in diversification. Our rye in 2013, we accumulated nearly 140 pounds per acre. And is all that and available to the crop following termination? Ah, that's a good, good question. Oh, okay, I've got a couple another questions here. <laughs> One says cereal rye is the biomass champ. Yes, sir, it is, or yes, ma'am. Uh, corn silage was not cut in May. Corn silage was cut in September, second week, or actually it was about the, nearly the first of October in 2014, so it's quite a bit later. And the cover crop was planted within a couple days, as in two or at most three days. Sometimes it took us three days to get all of Tim's plots planted. He had several studies, not just this one. So keep those questions coming. We did not fertilize any of these cover crops, okay? No fertility added. Remember 2012 was quite dry. This is at the ISU dairy farm, our, both of our, our sites both years. And we had about 100 pounds of nitrate available, 100 pounds of nitrogen available as nitrate when we planted the cover crops in both years. So here we're taking up well, a little more than that because we're getting oxidation of organic matter. Soil is warmed up 
and conditions were quite a bit slower and we had a lot more rain in, in uh, spring of 2014 if you recall it was a very very wet spring but we're my, my assumption here is that nearly all of this nitrate in both particularly in 2013 nearly all of it would have been gone without a cover crop would have been headed down towards the into the raccoon river although i can't prove that uh, spring growth, the picture on your left on top shows uh, a plot of rye uh, where the residue had been cut and removed or another one where it had been just chopped and left. And here's rye in a sister experiment in June. Rye gets pretty tall. Spring nitrate concentration. Oops, this is zero to 30 centimeters or one foot depth. And this is, again, uh, the five bars on the left are 2013, and rye, there was statistically less nitrate in the soil following a termination. This is across our two termination dates than the other treatments, which were all similar to one another. In 2014, the canola and the control and the turnip were all similar to one another. Camelino had significantly less nitrate in the soil than those three treatments, and rye had significantly less nitrate still than any of the other four. Just a quick picture of what Tim's soybeans looked like. About to wrap this up, um, look at our soybean yields, and in this case, we're looking at them by termination date. The blue bar is the early termination date, early May, the red bar is late termination. Uh, we don't have differences between control, no cover crop, that would be camelina and canola and turnip, but the rye yield was lower. Now this is kilograms per hectare, 3,500 kilograms per hectare, that's 52 bushels. So we're about, 50, about 49, 50 bushels for soybeans following the rye. Whereas the camelina, the canola and the controls were at about 4,000. That's 60 bushels per acre. 2014, again, no differences for soybean yield between early and late May termination dates. No statistical differences for the camel, soybeans following camelina, canola, no cover crop or the turnip. However, we do have a difference with rye, where rye is impacted more uh, by the late termination date than the early termination date, and both are lower, lower yielding than the 70 bushels per acre that we averaged for the other, other uh, cover crops. We look at the effect of biomass removal on these, on these cover crops, which cover crops can be used for as a forage, in which case they're not called a cover crop by RMA. Here we have no differences in 2013 how between with or without biomass removal, the blue is where the biomass was shredded, or chopped and left on the plot. Red, red is where it was removed. That can result in warmer soils. But again, we're looking at early and late May. Rye, again, as seen before, lower yielding. 2014, again, no differences whether the residue is removed or not. We're planting soybeans later than corn. Everybody mostly will do that. Okay, in conclusion, winter rye had the greatest accumulation of biomass, nitrogen, and carbon. It outperformed all the other cover crop entries we've tested in these, in these two studies. Um, and, and the effects of adding other species, whether it's a two-way or a three-way mixture, was really not apparent at all on yield of biomass yield, carbon or nitrogen accumulation, or influence on the subsequent corn crop. We didn't, haven't tested the mixtures on soybeans, so I can't, I'm not gonna go there at this point. At right, the very top on this slide, termination timing is important when winter rye precedes, precedes corn. That continues to be important. I would not kill winter rye and plant corn the same day. I would give it that 10 day period. Uh, that said, that rye is, was superior in many regards, 
bison camelina survives w very well in Iowa following a late seed season. It's survived in, in good stands every single seeding we've done, except the one where I had a bad seed lot. I get credit for that. Uh, importantly, biomass removal did not influence soybean yield. Okay, that's a big, that can be a big deal. And cover crops with the biomass we were growing did not influence weeds in uh, subsequent corn. So with that, I'd open it up for questions, but I think I'm out of time. So probably let Nathan go now and I will stay here and be available to answer questions. Oh, I see one question here. Is all that N available to the crop following termination? That's a good question. Probably not. It would depend on the stage of rye and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, preceding corn where our rye is relatively short and immature, my, my thought there, unless we're very droughted out, that nitrogen will be available. If you're talking two, three, four, five thousand pounds of rye per acre and your, and your CN ratio is 30, 40, or 50 to one, it will not all be available. It'd probably tie up some N for the corn. We're not going to get that kind of, of rye biomass production in Iowa. Uh, before before corn, unless we plant the corn in late May, and we generally don't want to do that. For soybean, tying up nitrate like that might be good. Perhaps we'll stimulate a little nitrogen fixation earlier and save some of that end cycling from organic matter that's less available in that high CN ratio rye residue for next year. All right, hey, thank you, Andy. Um, Nathan, I got your presentation up here. Feel free to take you know 15 or 20 minutes. You can go past the 8 o'clock mark if you want to, and then we'll have questions for both of our presenters. After. I think I could go past the 8 o'clock mark just asking questions of Andy uh, after that presentation. So so thank you. Uh, um, thank you also to those uh, watching and those that maybe watch or listen later. Um, I'm very happy to be here, thankful to PFI for uh, hosting this. Um, one thing I love about PFI is that the members ask questions. Uh, I, I love being able to, to answer those, and I, I love even more being able to ask them. So uh, at the end of the slides, I've got a few questions of my own that uh, hopefully uh, some of the people watching can uh, can help me out with. So this is a picture <clears throat> from our one of our fields this fall. Um, a picture taken from the combine seat. So um, I would love to say the entire field looked like this. Unfortunately, it didn't, but this is uh, one of the highlights, I guess. So um, this is, like I said, a picture taken from the from the seat of the combine this fall. This is a close-up shot of what your what you saw on the previous slide. Um, so I. I did stop the combine during harvest. It's a little bit rare, but I stopped the combine during harvest and uh, climbed out and took some pictures. Uh, and this is the mix that we planted. And I'll go into uh, why we chose this mix, um, but in, in, a, in a couple slides. But just to highlight, uh, 20 pounds an acre of winter rye. Uh, when I say winter rye, I unless I mention otherwise, I'm referring to winter cereal rye. Um, This uh, this mix also 20 pounds of spring barley, 10 pounds of oat, uh, three pounds of rapeseed, a pound and a half each of brown mustard and broadleaf mustard, um, and I I like to get information out there too to help other farmers make decisions. Uh, so seed cost is $27 an acre, uh, aerial seeded on September 7th, uh, and the photo was taken about a month later on uh, um, October 5th. This is a mix that uh, I plan for fall grazing. So it's the the mix that I use changes a little bit depending on the crop that I'm seeding into, whether I'm seeding into corn or seeding into soybeans, um, and what time I plan on having my cattle in that in that field to graze. <clears throat> I do like grazing after corn much better than grazing after soybeans just because uh, there's more feed available uh, in a harvested cornfield than in a harvested bean field. So that's that's why a lot of my 
uh, photos are taken uh, taken in that way. This is the same field. Um, this is a photo taken just this weekend, and there's there's really good biomass. And I, I asked the question of Andy, air dried versus uh, oven dried, uh, because this field had between 1,500 and 1,700 pounds of biomass, air dried biomass, an acre uh, with that mix. And again, an excellent fall, aerial seeded, a month roughly before harvest. So there was a lot of time for growth this fall with good moisture for growth as well. This 15 to 1,700 pounds of biomass, again, as I said, unfortunately the whole field does not look like that. Um, but in many areas it's, it's very good. Um, and just a, a point of reference, if you remember those numbers, I'll reference them uh, in a few slides uh, also. Um, the cattle are, are currently in this field grazing right now and as I mentioned the stand is is not even from uh, one end to the other and so I would love to do a study where I uh, use those GPS trackers on cattle uh, to determine where in the field they're spending most of their time and correlate that grazing with a uh, drone or satellite image of the field taken in the fall with an NDVI index uh, of plant vegetation and see if there's a, a correlation between where they spend their time uh, that would be really interesting to me. So the the picture on the on the right, the smaller picture, that's a spring barley uh, plant uh, that's growing. And I took a picture of that one because that one will uh, soon be dead. I guess it won't make it till spring. Uh, Andy, second trimester dry cows. That uh, that's correct. Um, there's a. a couple odd ones out there but uh, the majority of the herd is that and there's right now there's uh, 36 cows on 150 acres um, they've been there for two weeks uh, they'll probably be there for another three uh, weather dependent so this is uh, I showed you the spring barley plant taken um, just last weekend this is a, a mustard plant taken out of that same field uh, but this photo was taken back in October, at the end of October. So this mustard plant had had not quite two months of growth. It'd be uh, seven weeks or so of growth. And you can see there's uh, about eight inches to ten inches of, of nice root underneath with uh, some great growth uh, on the top. So those are just a couple pictures to start with. Um, and I, I have a slide kind of like Andy's of, of why do we use cover crops on our farm uh, and I'm sure those of you that use cover crops have a list also of, of why you might use cover crops or those that are interested uh, in trying them for the first time this might be a good list for you um, soil quality erosion protection nutrient scavenging uh, benefit soil organisms reduce reduce harmful organisms reduce water loss um, by improving infiltration and provide additional forage for livestock and ulti ultimately I uh, would like to improve yields. Um, so these are really diverse goals and I, I don't believe that a diverse set of goals like this can be met with a single cover crop species and when we started cover crops uh, we started with rye uh, which does a great job of of filling that gap. It makes an excellent starter cover crop but um, we have diverse goals like this, like I mentioned, um, and I, I think that is that's what led us to ask the question of what other cover crop species should we plant? And when we ask that question, you know, we need to look for answers somewhere. Um, Lee, uh, the question of too late to do a biomass analysis, I, I don't think so. Um, the weight analysis that, that I have done is just one that I've done. I go out, clip the biomass, just let it air dry, and weigh it. Um, as far as a nutrient analysis for the biomass, um, I'm sure there's some places I could send that. I haven't done that. Um, so when it comes to the decision making that we that we got to of, of why uh, we should add or what cover crops we should add to our mix. Uh, we looked to a lot of different places. One of the first ones of course was PFI. 
Um, and they had a cover crop variety trial that they had done, have done for a few years now that I believe complements uh, the work that, that Andy's doing quite well. Um, I also work with Green Cover Seed uh, and their, their Smart Mix uh, calculator. Um, and the Midwest Cover Crops Council uh, is another one. They have a cover crop guide uh, selector tool. And then uh, also PFI farmers and staff. Um, and they're, they're, there's great resources here. So uh, there's, that's what led us to, to try some different species. And um, we'll see if, if, I can, if I can do this little tool also. But uh, if you'll notice uh, here in the, uh, this section that includes brown mustard, rapeseed, and oilseed radish, um, in 2013 and 2014, um, at, this, at this site, um, the rapeseed and oilseed radish were, I'll say close, you know, in, in 20, 2013 the radish had um, more cover in 2014, the rapeseed had more cover. Um, but because we, we looked at this and we looked at green cover seed, the, the radish has a similar growth to that rapeseed and to the mustard, but it's about three times the cost. And so that's another, another factor that, that we look at when we're including that. So having this information on growth is very helpful. Um, and then we go to our, our different suppliers uh, to, to figure out what species we can use. This is just an example that I ran um, from our farm uh, using that number from before. Again, this assumes an even stand across the field. It assumes 40% utilization. It assumes $115 a ton forage price, and it assumes a $36 establishment cost. Um, you could probably argue with every one of those points if you would like, but I think it's a, a an opportunity for you to plug in your own numbers um, for your farm and, and come up with the calculation. Um, and basically I show this calculation to show that integrated farms, integrated crop livestock producers have an advantage um, because we can pay for our cover crops in the feed and the forage that's utilized. Um, and so it's the quickest payback on our covers. I think cover crops can provide long-term benefits, but that short-term return in the pocketbook is, is a very beneficial thing to have. Um, I also think if you're adopting cover crops for the first time that it's easier to do with livestock in the field. And the, the key there is having livestock in the field and not just uh, penned up uh, somewhere else. And uh, the one point that I wanted to add to, to Andy's, um, he, he talked about the uh, spring barley and oat and how those plants died over winter um, and that nitrate or nitrogen that they had taken up would be uh, released relatively quickly. Um, and I would hypothesize that if that oat and spring barley is growing in the fall, taking up nitrogen and other nutrients, those cows come along and take a bite of them uh, and process them through their system that we might be converting some of that nitrogen into a, a little more stable form, some of it. Um, and, and I think that's a, a benefit too. So um, I have a, a couple slides just on matching the seed mixes to the grazing window that you're looking at. Um, and as Andy mentioned, planting rye before corn, winter rye before corn, can have some struggles. And so the fall grazing before corn that I have done, I like using the spring barley um, more so than oat because we aerial seed much of our cover crops and pilots like spring barley much better than they like oat. Um, and that's a simple weight, uh, the density of the seed. Uh, so spring barley, uh, it grows in the fall, it grows pretty nicely, and then it winter kills and you can plant your corn in the spring uh, relatively well. Um, cold tolerant brassicas to extend that grazing window into the fall as, as late as you can in early winter. Um, and I put overwintering legumes and this is one of the items that I always have a question on because I, I struggle to find a legume uh, that, that will do well and it's glad to see that Andy also struggles to find a legume uh, that would do well. Um, 
So in this example, something that I have done in the past is oats, spring barley, and rapeseed and mustard. Um, I have used common and, and hairy vetch before. I haven't recently just because the cost to growth ratio is, is not very good um, from my perspective. And spring grazing before soybeans. So this would be after a corn crop. Um, and and uh, using those winter annual grasses, your winter rye in particular, a brassica mix, and then possibly some, some quick growth legumes if you are able to seed some legumes early in the spring um, before soybeans. I think that would be great. I'm looking forward to trying some winter peas seeded very early in the spring uh, and seeing how they grow. Uh, but there's some of those legumes also that you can't aerial seed as well or effectively or they're very expensive to aerial seed. So an example that, that I have here would be winter rye with radish and rapeseed and then seed winter pea in the spring uh, as just an example. Um, how about clover as a winter tolerant uh, legume? Um, I've used crimson clover before and as far as the clovers go that's probably my favorite uh, but that was following a small grain um, and I I have not really tried it following a row crop like corn or soybeans. Um, I'm just nervous about that establishment time that it needs. So I, I would like to try it and I, I think there's some years and situations where it would work. This fall probably would have been a great time to try it. Um, but yes, Bruce, I, I, I think there's some potential there. Um, and this is to kind of hit on Andy's point, and I'm glad he talked about um, planting corn after after rye because one of the ways that I manage rye before planting corn is I graze it down, and so I don't have as much uh, biomass to deal with. Um, I have some root biomass, as you can see in this picture. There's you know only three to four inches of above ground growth um, with roughly 9 to 10 inches of root growth underneath. So I've allowed this rye plant to recover um, enough leaf area that I can use an herbicide and, and kill it. Um, but I don't have so much residue on top as to cause me as many issues with my corn germinating. So um, I also, in this field, when I do that, I, I always have strip till. So I have a dark strip there already uh, that, that I believe helps me significantly. So that's why I just uh, put that picture in there quick. I do have a, a couple of cautions when it comes to grazing um, cover crops following uh, a row crop. And as you can see from this slide, it's herbicide labels, herbicide labels, and herbicide labels. Um, and if you look, this is uh, from a, a an herbicide that, that we don't use on our farm but is, is commonly used in uh, some row crop production. It's do not graze or harvest winter cover crops for food or animal feed for a minimum of 18 months. So if you use this herbicide in the growing season you might not just be affecting that fall, you might be affecting the next fall as well. So that's a caution um, that I have and also as Andy mentioned too um, he highlighted the crop insurance rules. Communicate with your crop insurance agent um, to make sure because there's a distinction between mechanically harvesting for feed and grazing uh, for feed. A couple of the biggest questions that I have um, always involve the best seeding method um, because I think that aerial seeding gives me a greater growth time in the fall. Um, but the consistency isn't what I would like and so that makes a cover crop more expensive when it's not seeded like it should be. Um, sourcing and mixing seed, there's there's a lot of sources for especially the small grains. Um, unfortunately not really locally but I think 
think that's coming, but uh, and mixing some of your own seed to reduce some costs. I always have a question on grazing. I, I always want to learn more on grazing uh, and grazing connected to covers. Um, and then which chemical programs to use in non-GMO corn to be able to interseed cover crops at that V4, V5 stage? So those are the biggest questions that I have. And I see Lee uh, has a question again. Have I tried baling rye in the spring? Uh, yes, I have. Um, and it made some, some excellent hay. Um, it was seeded. Uh, I actually segregated this part of the field out from crop insurance because I no-tilled my beans into standing rye, mowed, raked, and baled uh, the rye off the top. And if I, it's been three years ago now or so, but uh, it was over two tons an acre of of rye hay, uh, and it's it's pretty good forage uh, to use for for stockers. So um, that was that was a really really good thing to have and it, it it worked but like you said it wouldn't work in a wet spring and if I were to do it again I wouldn't have beans in the ground first because I could get uh, really stuck uh, with some beans trying to grow up and mowed rye so I could just leave the rye there for mulch and have really nice mulch too so that would be a, a possibility thanks thanks for that question um, and, and also just thanks for the opportunity where we went a little, little bit long here, but hopefully we'll have some time for some more questions. Um, that's my email address. I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback uh, and your thoughts um, because there's I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. So thank you very much. And thanks, Steve. Yeah, Nathan, um, great work. Thanks for uh, sharing your experience with us. So uh, if anybody there has any questions for either Nathan or Andy, please go ahead and... Uh, Get them in the chat box there, and we've got about 20 minutes uh, to cover anything here. So, um, Andy or Nathan, when you see them come in, if you want to just uh, jump on it, you're welcome to. I wanted to thank Nathan for uh, mentioning the, the issues of grazing restrictions. And again, the, it's real important to know what you put out in terms of herbicides and when. Um, real important. You can get into some real problems. Great. There's, there's some herbicides herbicides used that have 30 month plus um, grazing restrictions on them so it is is very very important um, to check that um, if incorporating grazing covers is is uh, something you're interested in doing on your farm those herbicides aren't tremendously common but they're used and they're out there so it's something to be aware of restrictions on Thanks, some of Andy. our commonly used herbicides of up to 40 months particularly on canola and canola relatives as in the other brassicas Another another forty months is a long time, and that that's one other issue with the legumes too is that some of those plant backs are just so long, um, and when you have seed that's so expensive as some of those legumes, um, you you definitely want them to work, and so you stack things against you uh, with a short fall um, and a limited growing season, and then if you put a herbicide restriction on top of it. Um, you're really just limiting your chances for success. Um, and yes, Lee, those those herbicide restrictions in many cases apply to hay made from those covers. I will say many, but not all, um, because I I do know there's some that make a dis some label herbicide labels that make a distinction between dry hay harvested and grazing. Um, I I can't tell you what those herbicides are uh, off the top of my head, but I have seen them looking through. Yeah, another issue with the uh, use of, of legumes in cover crops um, in corn soybean systems is, again, a lot of people are interested in improving nitrogen relations by fixation. And really, in many situations, we have adequate nitrate in the soil, and the legumes are going to live on that. They're going to take up that nitrate until it's not present, and that's when they would begin fixing. But nitrogen fixation does not happen under cold soil conditions. And most of our legumes, where we're growing them in 
certainly the methods we're using that we're using where we're drilling, uh, they, they're not fixing in. Seth, Seth Applegate in his study dug a lot of vetch and found very few red nodules. I think it was a couple, literally a couple. And we had good establishment of, of vetch and it overwintered well, but uh, uh, seed is quite expensive and very, very little growth in the time frame. In Georgia, vetch by itself will make up to 10,000 <clears> 10, pounds per acre before you plant your corn. But that's Georgia. The land of no winter. So uh, I don't, we just don't have, I haven't found a really good legume yet. I've worked with winter peas quite a bit in Montana, which is a lot colder than here, and they simply don't survive 20 below when there's no snow cover. And we had that a couple times last winter in, in much of Iowa. Hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you at some point, Nathan, about how they do. when you try Yeah, and that, Andy, like you said, I think those, those would have to be seeded in the spring um, bef before that crop because, like you said, the, the odds of overwintering just aren't, aren't great. Again, they're expensive, and for me, aerial seeding, uh, a large, uh, a large seeded legume like that is is difficult. Um, Greg, I I see your question. I, I'm curious about that myself, um, and that's kind of where the interseeding question comes from, because you like Andy said, there's other areas of the country that show some pretty good success with interseeding uh, into corn, and they're using annual ryegrass and maybe a radish and hairy vetch that's that that might be what they're using some shade tolerant species um, and having that kind of growing and then go dormant underneath the canopy and then having some great forage uh, later in the season I don't know much about varieties um, so I can't I can't really tell you too much on that one other than to say I'm curious about the same thing. Um, my favorite cover crop mix on bean stubble, assuming aerial seeding. Um, my, my favorite cover crop mix over bean stubble, based on what I've seen the last couple of years, would be um, some spring barley with rapeseed and brown mustard. Um, you know, the oats and tillage radishes, I just feel like they don't aerial seed very well. Um, from the pilot's perspective, I know they always struggle with oats. Um, and, and this is seeding over top of soybeans going into corn the next year. Uh, and, and so you'd have your, your uh, spring barley, um, your, your rape seed, and your brown mustard. You'd have some time to graze it in the fall. You wouldn't have anything over winter would be the the drawback there. So if you wanted to get it in the spring, um, you wouldn't have anything. But um, based on my experience, that'd be uh, what I would prefer um, and then have, have cattle on at the fall if I were going to do that or just have the cover um, there in the fall. Um, if, you, if you wanted to have a, a winter wheat or a winter rye or a, a winter annual grass, you could do that, but I would do that at a reduced rate. Um, and again, I, I'd maybe look at uh, look closely at my planter setup. Um, and if I'm planting over a strip, you know, if I have some things on the planter to help that corn plant get started and avoid or reduce the like the damage of, that uh, that Andy's barley. early and slides barley showed. Barley built to germinate rapidly, uh, particularly malting barley, but feed barley also germinates really rapidly. You look at something like radishes, and they're pretty slow to imbibe water. So if, there, if radish seed is sitting on the soil surface, it's going to take a lot of rain to get it started, whereas it'll take much less rain in, in being wet a shorter period of time for something like a, a malt barley, particularly. Now, you wouldn't want to pay malt barley prices, but some years there's an awful lot of malt barley that doesn't make malt grade, and I don't know, my dad and I used to go up to Colorado and buy it in the San Luis Valley, and it was pretty cheap. It, it would make great cover crop. Because it's smaller seed, so you get more seed per, per bushel, and that decreases your costs. Now, I don't know, there's not a lot of malt barley production left in western Minnesota, so you'd probably have to go to more central North Dakota at this point, but, you know, 
come back with a couple truckloads. Probably could sell it. Be my guess. It uh, it would it would uh, germinate much quicker than than many of our other cover crop entries. I think that that you've got a good point there, Nathan. Yeah, we have a new study that's starting starting this next next summer, 2016. It's a study with researchers in North Dakota, Minnesota, and in Iowa, where we're going to be broadcasting rat, oilseed radish, winter rye, camelina, and hairy vetch into corn and soybean at two different stages. The corn is at black layer, and 10 days before we hit black layer. So we're not going real early, like six leaf stage. And then uh, in soybeans, just prior to leaf drop and 10 days before leaf drop. So uh, R6 and a half and R5 probably. We'll see what the weather does. And uh, have, have some of those results ready, um, certainly on establishment by this time next year. Um, Two years from now, we'll have a couple years from uh, at least four locations, uh, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Iowa, assuming the weather halfway cooperates. And we'll have data even if the weather doesn't cooperate. We can tell you it didn't work. But I'm hopeful that it will work. Um, uh, yeah, Lee, I, I see your question. Um, so that the mix that I mentioned, uh, with no livestock, um, you want good spring growth before corn. Um, it, it's always tough. Um, winter wheat is a, is a suggestion, um, just because it, it'll grow at a little bit warmer temperature than winter rye will. Winter rye can grow at some pretty cool temps. Winter wheat is, is close, but not quite there. Um, so that would give you a little bit more time to manage it in the spring so it doesn't get ahead of you. Um, it's, it's always, I'm always uh, wary of making recommendations before corn uh, of, of overwintering uh, overwintering grasses, uh, uh, especially, um, I I'm not afraid of using rye now myself. But like I said, I'm I'm using a, a strip. I have row cleaners that are set up really well. I I watch my down pressure very closely. Um, so so I'll, I'll say that's what I do with with a caution. If you're if you feel confident. And comfortable with the way you can set your planter up to manage that residue in the spring, um, I'm okay with having winter rye and killing it at that eight inch to ten inch stage, or letting it get a little bigger and grazing it back down. Um, but like you said, uh, for you with no livestock, um, you probably maybe want to hit that six to eight inch uh, stage if you're if you're trying it the first time and like I said I, I like having a strip there to plant over um, whether that's a, a true strip till machine that you're putting fertilizer down in a strip or if it's just a, a tillage implement so your that you're you're making a strip that your uh, uh, there, your planter will follow several companies that sell spring camelina what's needed is a false seeded cover crop that will over if you're interested in overwintering is a winter camelina and the only company that sells any is uh, Charlie Reif with High Plains Development High Plains Crop Development in Torrington Wyoming and seed supplies are highly very very limited at this moment he uh, he didn't have one or two hailstorms last year Charlie had four so there was no seed production last year so at this point camelina is not commercially available at this moment uh, for for fall, a, a winter camelina. You, if you you could plant spring and it would grow, but it would then it would die. It will not overwinter. So hopefully in, next year Charlie will have uh, seed available. And there's also a question there on winter rye vernalizing. 
Uh, typically, if it's a northern developed winter rye, say Canada, uh, you know, you plant it in the spring, you can plant winter wheat in Montana, Montana winter wheat in the spring, and it will sit there and it will not vernalize all summer long. Now, you'll accrue a whole lot of diseases, uh, including one that will go to, can go to corn. So I think that could be a real issue in some cases. I don't know that we have wheat curl mites in, in Iowa, but certainly if you're going to plant wheat, winter wheat in the spring so that it didn't vernalize it as a season long cover, uh, there could be some advantages to that, but there might be some issues with wheat curl mites vectoring a couple of viral diseases to your corn. I don't know, that hasn't been looked at here. Uh, Iowa could be too wet for them certainly issue can be an issue from uh, Nebraska up through the Dakotas into Montana so I would I would be careful on that one and when winter wheat's another option as a cover crop uh, haven't included in any of uh, our studies here at this point I'd like to at some time uh, we have some real there are a lot of very superior winter wheats with high degrees of winter hardiness again think of those developed in North Dakota when they had a program a breeding program at North Dakota State in Montana State, where they still have winter wheat breeding program, they have winter up there and no snow cover a lot of years. So they're very tough winter wheats. Now, the issue with some of their winter wheats is that they're farming in a 12, 13, 14 inches of rain per year. So they get 12, 13, 14 inches of rain every 12 months. Disease resistance is much less of an issue. Uh, I can see in Iowa where it's pretty warm and pretty humid some days. Um, the, the wheats, the winter wheats with limited disease resistance levels could could fall apart on us pretty uh, very quickly. But certainly I would think winter wheat, if you're in just a cover crop, winter wheat seed is likely going to be cheaper than rye and a lot more available. But you're going to want to watch where it comes from. Uh, TAM 105, TAM 108, any of the TAMs from Texas, they're probably available. They're not very winter hardy. They're developed for Texas. Uh, we're a lot colder than Texas any winter. And so, you know, you'd want winter wheats probably more out of South Dakota or points north. But again, uh, you get too far west, you're going to have a lot less selection pressure in the breeding programs for disease resistance. So, you know, wheats that are well adapted to eastern South Dakota might be an option as a cover crop here. It could be a lot less money. Certainly in your part of the woods, Nathan, or your part of the prairie, South Dakota's close. <laughs> yeah, South Dakota, South Dakota State, South Dakota State uh, still does some, uh, has some winter wheat variety testing too. So there is some information about uh, some of those varieties that are there. Um, and Greg, uh, to, to follow your, your line of questioning, um, my answer is really I, d I don't know and and to I'll I'll, f I'll add to that um, you know is is cereal rye the the best thing for what you want to do um, and and I'm not a, I'm not quite sure how to accomplish what I'm reading you're trying to accomplish either um, so so I'll I'll still stick with my I don't know um, but yeah, like I said, I think that, like you said, I think that annual rye grass for what you're talking about um, might might be a better option from what I've read. I have no personal experience with annual rye grass. Um, I would ask if if you're plowing it down in the spring to plant a grazing corn, um, are you are you really concerned with it going to seed? Is it the seed issue, or is it just the the forage quality issue um, when that rye plant goes to seed? So, um, you know, if if the rye goes to yeah, that's that's kind of where I thought you were headed, but um, I I just wanted to wanted to check for sure. But yeah, I based on what I know with cereal rye. And what I've read on annual ryegrass, I, I think annual ryegrass might be where you want to go. But uh, like I said, I, do, I don't have experience with it. Yeah, winter ryegrass, uh, excuse me, winter ryegrass. 
annual ryegrass is going to, it will always have a lot less winter hardiness than winter rye. They're very different species. They have similar, they have rye in the name, but they're not very closely related. So uh, the, the annual ryegrass definitely, if it's spring seeded, uh, and you seeded spring rye, because you can get spring rye as opposed to winter rye, so that will not fertilize, that do not require fertilization. Uh, and, and it matures relatively quickly. And again, very stemmy. In general, your rye cultivars have a lot higher, it, as they advance in maturity, have a lot fewer leaves than a lot of the forage wheats or forage triticales that were developed as forages, uh, where people consciously wanted improved forage quality when there's also a higher biomass yield. So is, you, you need to keep rye, winter rye, raised down pretty well. Once it goes reproductive, it, it will still initiate new tillers and grow, grow, but it depends a lot on nitrogen in the soil and, of course, water. And, and rarely are we limited for water in Iowa in the spring, but if you haven't fertilized your, your, your winter rye and, and it's gone reproductive, you've grazed off all the leaves, uh, if it's nitrogen limited at all, it won't initiate new tillers, relatively few. Okay, well, uh, unless we see somebody else start to pop another question in that chat box, we're about out of our time here, so we might just consider this a good time to wrap it up. Um, so definitely a big thank you to our presenters tonight for preparing some great presentations, and thanks to everybody here who showed up and asked some great questions. Um, it was really a, this is a nice farm in our, thanks to everyone for being a part of it, and uh, tune back in next week or any other time this winter for another another uh, installment in our Farm and Our series. So big thanks to Andy and to Nathan for joining us and sharing their knowledge.